guys? It's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about the 1990 Plainfield, Illinois F5 tornado. Now this storm really took a lot of people by surprise. Yeah. Um, I remember hearing a lot about it back in the day. Very interesting case study. Yeah, very, very interesting. We're, we're going to talk about a few things as to why they were caught so off guard. We're, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into it. But before we get started, you know what to do. Give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it and subscribe down below so you never miss the next Meteorology Monday. Like we've done in past case studies, we're going to go ahead and give an overview, a meteorological setup of the event, and then we're going to drill down to the specific storm itself. As always, everything that we use to put together this case study will be linked down below if you want to check it out for yourselves. Now this area of the country is no stranger to severe weather during this time of year. In fact, derechos are very common here. And if you guys want to know more about derechos, we actually did an entire case study on the 2020 August derecho that went through the Midwest. If you want to check that out, it'll pop up in the corner over here. So what makes this event a little bit different than previous events is how all the meteorological ingredients came together. Let's dive into the meteorological setup for the only known F5 or EF5 tornado to ever occur in the U.S. in the month of August. On Tuesday, August 28, 1990, a 250 millibar jet stream was positioned along the U.S.-Canadian border, putting northern Illinois just south of the right entrance quadrant of the jet streak. These upper level winds were analyzed to be around 80 to 85 knots. This was near record levels for late August across this region. An upper level shortwave trough was moving through the Great Lakes area, dragging a cold front southward through southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. Surface winds ahead of the front were out of the southwest, while behind it were out of the northwest. There were also some reports of wind blowing off of Lake Michigan. The combination of these features, along with a strong August sun, would drive the mechanical lift and dynamics necessary for the strong to severe thunderstorms later that day. In fact, all the necessary ingredients for multi-cell and supercell storms with damaging winds and large hail were there. These included moisture, instability, lift, and wind shear at the mid and upper levels. One thing that stood out was the lack of significant low-level wind shear. If low-level wind shear is not present, it would be very difficult to spawn tornadoes. So as we discussed at the beginning of that, the northern Illinois portion where this tornado would eventually take place was actually just south of what we call the right entrance region of the jet streak. Now there are two regions of a jet streak that are normally where we look to for tornado development because it has a lot of uplift and it has a lot of that low level shear and that's the right entrance and the left exit. Well with northern Illinois being just south of the right entrance it was missing that vital component that would give the uplift and the low level shear. So it was just on the border of having it but at this point we don't have it yet. This would add to the confusion and the late warnings later in the day as we're about to see with the National Weather Service. Around 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Severe Storms Forecast Center in Kansas City, Missouri, the U.S. governmental entity prior to the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, upgraded their severe thunderstorm outlook from slight to moderate risk for the northern Illinois area. Around 12 p.m. Central Daylight Time, surface temperatures were nearing 90 degrees Fahrenheit and dew points were in the mid-70s to low 80s. This is extremely oppressive even for Florida, let alone the Midwest. As the cold front approached southern Wisconsin, clouds began to form and quickly shot upward into towering cumulus. Within the hour, those towering cumulus would grow to become thunderstorms across the Wisconsin-Illinois border. Due to the extreme conditions in place ahead of the front, with ample moisture, instability, and upper level wind shear, these storms quickly turned into supercells. At 1.28 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the NSSFC issued a severe thunderstorm watch for portions of northern Illinois. A short time later, a tornado touched down in Pecatonica, Illinois, west of the Rockford area. The tornado caused light damage and no injuries were reported. Another brief tornado occurred near Seward. Over the next 30 minutes, the main storm would explode in strength as it moved southeast across DeKalb and Kane counties in Illinois. At 2.32 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a severe thunderstorm warning for northern Kane County, Illinois. Temperatures south of the cold front were now in the mid to upper 90s, with oppressive dew points between 75 and 80 degrees. Values of Cape, 
convective available potential energy, which is a measure of instability in the atmosphere, rose from 4,000 joules per kilogram to an incredible 7,000 joules per kilogram by 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time. One ingredient that was still lacking was low-level shear. That would suddenly change, however, when low-level winds that were generally out of the northwest quickly turned southwesterly. Discovered through reanalysis years later and unknown at the time, the jet streak was moving southward, shifting northern Illinois from just outside the extremely favorable right entrance region to well within it. With surface winds now out of the southwest and the upper level winds still from the northwest, the change in wind direction allowed nearly 90 degrees of directional wind shear with height, more than enough for rotating storms and an increasing tornado threat. Effective shear was calculated to be in excess of 40 knots. This parameter helps identify whether a thunderstorm will become a supercell or not. When the effective shear exceeds 40 knots, it is an indicator of supercell thunderstorms. The combination of these weather conditions would cause the main storm to grow to a height of 65,000 feet. On radar, the storm looked like a classic supercell, including a hook echo, and was exhibiting a right turning motion, meaning the storm was moving right of the upper level steering winds that would normally drive the storm to the east. Over the next 30 minutes, this storm would produce straight line damaging winds and golf ball to tennis ball sized hail. Although reports of wind damage were being received, no tornado damage was reported at this time. A few more brief tornado touchdowns occurred in rural southern Kane County. However, this would be the precursor of what was to come. Around 3.16 p.m., what would become the Plainfield F5 tornado touched down just northwest of Oswego and Kendall County as an F1, crossing the Fox River and moving steadily southeastward towards Grand Park on the Kendall-Will County line. There, the tornado would increase its destructive power to an F2, F3 rating. Also around this time, things started to change very quickly for Plainfield. What started out as a hot sunny day became very dark with clouds taking on a yellow-green hue. At 3.23 p.m., the National Weather Service issued another severe thunderstorm warning for southern DuPage County, Illinois. In Plainfield, the winds began to pick up and power started going out on the west side of town. Shortly thereafter, the tornado would increase to a devastating F4, F5 as it struck the Wheatland Plains subdivision in rural Plainfield. At 3.31 p.m., Plainfield High School suffered a direct hit. Both the football and volleyball teams were practicing at the time, but took shelter before the storm arrived. Unfortunately, three faculty members that were preparing for classes lost their lives. What would be looked upon as some saving grace was the fact that classes were not scheduled to start until the following day. If the tornado came through one day later, the number of casualties could have been much worse. At 3.32 p.m., Plainfield Plaza is struck with F3 wind speeds as the tornado crosses Route 59, which is the main north-south artery through Plainfield. At 3.33, St. Mary Immaculate Parish is struck. The sanctuary was spared a direct hit, but suffered heavy damage. Its adjacent grade school was destroyed. Sadly, the principal, a music teacher, and a maintenance worker were killed, as winds were now in the F4 range. At 3.34 p.m., the tornado pulverizes Lily Cash and Peerless subdivisions before crossing Interstate 55 and sending several automobiles airborne. F4 damage would also occur in this area. The tornado managed to narrowly miss the Lewis Joliet shopping mall, sparing hundreds of lives. At 3.35 p.m., the tornado decimated the Crystal Lawn subdivision and Grand Prairie Elementary School with F3, F4 damage. A minute later, the tornado would strike the Warwick subdivision in Joliet, destroying 50 homes and taking two lives. At 3.37 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a severe thunderstorm warning for Southern Kane, Northern Kendall, DuPage, and Will Counties. At 3.38 p.m., the Plainfield tornado strikes the Crest Hill Lakes apartment complex, all but destroying an entire apartment building and killing nine people. At 3.42 p.m., the tornado would dissipate on the west side of Joliet. At 3.51 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a tornado warning for Will County. After the main tornado dissipated in Joliet, the parent thunderstorm continued producing wind damage as it moved through Kankakee County and on into Indiana. The storm produced nearly continuous wind damage over northern Illinois for four and a half hours. In summary, 
The tornado was on the ground for a total of 26 minutes, killing 29 people and injuring 353 more. The tornado left a damage path of 16.4 miles and ranged from 600 yards to half a mile wide. The tornado destroyed 470 homes and damaged an additional 1,000. The tornado totaled $165 million in damage. The Doppler radar for this area would not be installed for another two years. Dr. Fujita said this may be the most damaging tornado he'd ever studied. Not only was this F5 tornado disastrous, it was also very unusual for several reasons. The Plainfield tornado was the first ever tornado greater than an F3 rating since records began in 1950 to occur during the month of August in the state of Illinois. The tornado had low clouds and rain surrounding it, making it difficult to see. Because of this, no known photographs or videos of this tornado exist. This tornado remains the only F5 EF5 rated tornado documented in the United States during the month of August. The tornado approached from the northwest. Most tornadoes in this region approach from the southwest. And due to difficulty communicating, for example no cell phones, storm spotters were unable to report what was happening until 3.45 p.m. and the Chicago National Weather Service was unaware of the tornado until it was over. There were no sirens sounded to warn the people. All right, so there's a lot going on here, so let's yeah. talk about it being back in 1990. So that was before a lot of the modern technology we have nowadays, cell phones, a large spotter network, Doppler radar. A lot of things are in place now that weren't in place back then. So let's touch upon those things a little bit. Just like we discussed in our video of the 1974 outbreak, this is also another event that helped catapult the National Weather Service's modernization program with trying to get the Doppler radars out there to their sites. And I remember I was working for the National Weather Service within a year or two after the event and we were in our transition from our regular radars to going to Doppler radars. And I remember a lot of discussion in the National Weather Service on how great this is going to be, how we can do better warnings. That was an exciting time in the National Weather Service to get this new technology in place. As we had touched on, it said that the National Weather Service would not install a Doppler radar in this region for another two years after this event. I believe up until this point we had already had Norman, Oklahoma, maybe Melbourne, Florida, um, and I don't know where Chicago was on that list to get a Doppler, but I'm pretty sure they bumped it up to earlier either to be the third site or pretty soon after those first two Dopplers were installed. After seeing the destruction in Plainfield, it was definitely prevalent that they needed a Doppler radar in that area. In our play-by-play -play with all the times and everything, you probably noticed something weird and that is that there were no tornado warnings issued until 351 and the tornado dissipated at 342. This was kind of a um, big whoops of the day is between not having the modern radars that we have today, spotters being either out of position or not able to get to a phone, the storm being completely like rain wrapped and cloudy and people really not knowing what was happening, combined with the fact that there was wind damage already going on earlier in the day that was not tornado related, nobody knew that there was a tornado on the ground until after it happened and props to the NWS for throwing that tornado warning up but unfortunately the tornado had already dissipated by that time. Some of the good things that came out of this were at least the National Severe Storms Forecast Center identified the area to be a moderate risk. True. And also the National Weather Service in Chicago, when they had issued their severe thunderstorm warnings, at least that was appropriately placed for the storm. True. And as I think some of the wording during the modernization may have started to include that tornadoes could occur within a severe thunderstorm. Uh, I'm not sure if this was one of the storms that drove that or if maybe it was in place before, but definitely whenever there is a severe thunderstorm, you do need to be aware that there is a small possibility that a tornado could form. It's more unlikely than not, especially with the modern technology nowadays to be able to see in the storm and see the winds going everywhere. But back then, yeah, you definitely had to be careful, a uh, tornado could pop out of one of those storms. One of the reasons that the National Weather Service only had this as a moderate and not a high, or were looking to put out these warnings ahead of time also, 
was that we had discovered it nowadays through reevaluation, but back then they were not aware that the jet streak that would add that final piece of the puzzle had shifted southward over their region. Now, I do know that there were certain TV meteorologists that were saying, um, something's off here, and I know in the wording for the NWS uh, Sphere Thunderstorm warnings, they were kind of like, mm, something's not right, we don't see it, but something's happening. So they were trying to figure out what was going on as it was happening, and they did have the wording saying, okay, something might happen, we're just gonna cover our bases, and something did end up happening, so thankfully they were right. But at that time, they were still unaware of that jet streak shifting southward. That's right, and one other thing was the Storm Spotter Network. It wasn't as widespread as it is nowadays True. and they were also as, as you were doing some research you found that yeah. they were actually behind the storm so there wasn't any spotters out ahead of the storm to be able to relay that information and even if they were able to see it you didn't have cell phones you didn't have any quick means of communication to get to the weather service you had to pull over and use a pay phone or something to be able to call the weather right. service and let them know there's something on the ground right now I remember reading a report from one of the spotters on that day and he was like, oh, let me let me go up to Plainfield and see what's happening there. This was while he was behind the storm and he got to Plainfield and he was like, Did nobody had reported this. There was nothing coming over the NOAA weather radio or anything. So he quickly went to a gas station and called up NWS and was like, hey, there's tornado damage here and it's pretty severe. Um, and then pretty quickly NWS was able to go out there and say that it was F5 damage. And since the storm actually uh, exploded in strength really quickly, there really wasn't much time to warn, and unfortunately it was just too late, and there was no time to sound any sirens, there was no, no time to talk to you know, any emergency management folks to, to get people aware of what was going on. So it just, the speed in which this developed and rolled through, um, and then the lack of modern uh, communication, it, it really uh, caused this event to really be devastating. Yeah, I think this is a great example of one of those tornadoes where if it were to happen today with how far technology has come, even since 1990, I think you would see that the death toll is a lot less. So there you have the August 28, 1990 Plainfield, Illinois F5 tornado. Shout out to those of you who suggested doing the Plainfield, Illinois tornado case study. We have a long list of case studies that you guys have suggested, and we are going to keep chipping away at them. Again, if you like case studies like this, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe down below. It really helps us out and helps the channel out a lot. Follow us over on social media, Facebook and Instagram if you want to see more of our weather adventures, as well as checking out our School of Weather and our website, which is linked down below. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday.